Well, the clock on the well says 6.02, so uh, we will uh, get started tonight. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome back to this special evening edition of the Rancho Cordova Luncheon as we continue our deeper dive into the uh, understanding of the coronavirus. I'm Shelley Blanchard, Executive Director of the Cordova Community Council, and I am joined by Diane Rogers, President and CEO of the Rancho Cordova Chamber of Commerce, in bringing you a uh, real expert on the topic, our own city councilman and virologist, Dr. David Sander. As many of you remember, we spent an informative session with Dr. Sander back in late September, just as we headed into what we now know was a huge surge. At the time, we asked if he would come back once the vaccine was out. It is, and here we are. As we have remarked before, Dr. Sander may be the only councilman slash mayor in the entire world with a PhD in virology the study of viruses. As a scientist and an elected official, he has a unique vantage point on this most unusual situation. We are so fortunate he is joining us again to help us cut through some of the confusion and talk with us as neighbors. So how does he know so much about this topic? David is a graduate of St. Louis University who went on to become a graduate fellow at Tulane University of Medicine where he received the McCleskey Award for Excellent in Research, I'm not surprised, and a PhD in Cellular and Molecular Biology. He has put that experience to work in the US Congress, developing public policy as a Congressional Science Fellow. After moving to Rancho Cordova, he became an active community volunteer and leader and was elected to the Rancho Cordova City Council in 2002, which seems like an awfully long time ago, does it not? Uh, he has been reelected several times. Join us for this fascinating hour of science with a dose of government. Uh, we will be uh, fielding your questions, so as uh, so one comes to mind, go ahead and type it right into the Q&A function on your computer, and we will get to as many of them as we can in case they're not answered. So David, it is hard to believe that five months have passed since we last talked like this and so much has changed and happened. From your point of view, what the heck is going on? <laughs> Well, that is an awesome uh, introduction. Thank you, Shelley. It's, it's my pleasure to be here again. Uh, this is a, a weird confluence for me between my scientific life and my public elected official life. I may have used this joke last time I started one of these talks, but you know, my scientist friends always say, uh, what are you doing over there in that, in that public thing? You know, why, why would you want to do that? And I said, well, it makes me a more balanced person. You know, I've got the logical side of my life here in the scientific world, and then I've got the other side that's not so logical. <laughs> and the two together work out well. I never anticipated they would come together like this, and it's very unfortunate they did, but um, hopefully fortunate for Rancher Cordova that, um, that I just happened to be here at that time. So I am happy to present this information. Uh, Shelly gave you some of my background. I'll say right up front, I'm not a physician. This is not intended as medical advice. Uh, I'm a virologist, so I'm an expert on the virus. Uh, I am not a clinician that treats patients with this virus. So just take that uh, as sort of a grain of salt with, with my commentary here. In, in many cases, my information may be more correct than you might hear from a public health person or, or even a physician, uh, but not necessarily more helpful as a result, I may, uh, as a scientist, give you a more complex view that a, a public health person or, or a physician may simplify. So hopefully this strikes the right note. I'm aiming for a broad audience. So I'm gonna cover some very basic stuff and I'm gonna cover some more complex stuff. Uh, if you get lost on the complex, just wait a minute or so, I'll move on to another topic and you'll be fine. But with that, I think we might as well uh, get started. So. Today's discussion is going to be, first of all, what is a virus? So I have a feeling a lot of you know now, but nonetheless, let's talk about what a virus actually is. We're gonna talk about COVID-19, the disease caused by our virus of the moment. 
we're going to refresh you on testing and what testing is and where we are in this pandemic. And then we get to the main event. We'll talk about the vaccines. That'll take a good, probably the majority of our time together. I'm also going to tell you about how you get the vaccine, give you some idea about what I think is coming next, things to look out for. And finally, questions. And uh, I know we probably advertise this for an hour. I'm willing to stay longer than that to try to answer as many, uh, as many questions as I can. So moving on, what is a virus? Well, it's not such a simple question. Uh, and so here's the answer. A virus is really just a small little collection of genetic code, either DNA or RNA, usually surrounded by some protein. And all they want to do is replicate. All they want to do is make copies of themselves. They aren't alive. They can't consume energy or replicate on their own. They have to enter a host cell in order to make a copy of themselves. So they're not living by our definition of what's living and what's not. Now, often people will talk about killing the virus. Technically, that's not correct. It's not alive. You can't kill it. You can eliminate it. And so even I may fall into that trap. But I would challenge you, think about the virus as an inanimate object that solely seeks to replicate itself. So antibiotics, for example, work on bacteria, which are entire cells that can replicate themselves on their own, unlike a virus. Bacteria are alive, viruses are not. Bacteria are gigantic compared to viruses. Viruses are incredibly small and only antiviral medications or vaccines work to prevent uh, viruses infecting and uh, viral disease. So here, there's so many kinds of viruses. I'm just gonna give you a little, a little colored picture here about a few. You can see there are four types of viruses I've shown here on the left. There are more types than this, but these four are sort of uh, illustrative of the types that are out there. This is a fun one, tobacco mosaic virus on the, on the end. It's a coil of proteins on the outside. That's also referred to as the capsomere or the capsid. And if you look on the inside, that's its genetic material, which in this case is RNA. That little spiral there on the inside is its genetic material on the far left. If you look at the next one over, polyhedral virus. This virus doesn't have a membrane around it or a fatty layer. It just has protein on the outside with some larger protein sticking off. That's these little things that are sticking off here. It looks kind of alien, doesn't it? It looks like something you'd see in a, in a sci-fi movie. But in reality, it's a polyhedral virus with a protein coat. This one in particular is adenovirus, and we're going to be hearing about adenovirus a little bit later tonight. Next one over is a spherical virus. This is an envelope virus. So this is actually a, uh, there's a capsid protein that is wrapped around the RNA here in the core of this virus, but the outside is actually a membrane, like our cells have membranes, and it has proteins that stick through the membrane that are the outside of the virus. And then finally, there's this complex form of viruses, and this is a bacteriophage. This type of virus specializes just in infecting bacteria, hence the name bacteriophage. But there are so many other types of viruses, and there's pictures of a few over here on the right. You can see HIV, which most of us have heard of, and hepatitis, and Ebola. That's the crazy one that looks like a piece of spaghetti or a worm, depending on how you look at it. Rabies virus is over here, influenza virus, et cetera, herpes virus. So many types of viruses in the world, and there are so many of them, um, billions upon billions of, of these viruses, and they exist everywhere, uh, throughout the oceans, adrift in the air, uh, in and on all of us, and in the environment in which we live. So let's talk a little bit about what actually makes up those viruses, and we can look at it right here through uh, a little peek at the coronavirus. So this is our enemy of the moment, coronavirus. Now, these are pretty common viruses. We knew about them going back in the 60s, and I've listed four types here of coronaviruses that basically function as common cold viruses. So all of us have had probably one or more of these viruses. And then there, in recent years, though, there have been other human coronaviruses, and these are new. So MERS-CoV, which causes Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, that's actually found in camels as the main carrier of that virus, and it is a rather deadly disease. Uh, it can kill 20% of the people who, who come down with MERS. SARS-CoV, the original SARS, erupted about 10 years ago. And uh, that was a coronavirus that jumped probably from a bat or a pangolin, which is a, a form of mammal, 
in Southeast Asia to humans. And that particular SARS-CoV-1 uh, virus killed about 10% of the people who had infected. And now, of course, we have SARS-CoV-2. This is our so-called novel coronavirus, the new coronavirus that we discovered in 2019 and has been uh, causing a global pandemic ever since. So sometimes these coronaviruses infect animals. And I mentioned one that came from camels here and another one that came from pangolins and bats. Um, these coronaviruses infect uh, birds as well. And if they have the right sort of mutation, they can leap to a human. And probably one of the most key mutations that they have in their genome is when they alter the proteins that are on the surface. So here is a look at a coronavirus and we've got these proteins on the outside. The big one is the spike protein, the so-called spike protein. And you've probably heard more about that. The vaccines that are being developed are targeted at this protein because it is so prominent. It's also necessary for this virus, this virus's life cycle or the way in which it replicates itself. This particular spike protein is the means by which this virus binds to the surface of a cell and ultimately infects that cell. You can see some other proteins here that are stuck in that fatty outer part of the coronavirus. Um, there's an envelope protein, there's a membrane protein. And then on the inside of that fatty layer that sort of protects the, the genome on the inside, you've got a nucleocapsid protein. And then finally, you've got the RNA inside the virus protected by, by this outer layer and these proteins and ready to infect and take over a cell. So here I'm gonna show you a very cool actual photograph of SARS-CoV-2. So this is an electron micrograph. Instead of using light, we're using electrons to make this picture. So you can take pictures of super tiny things. And here you can see why coronavirus gets its name. Corona as in halo or crown around the virus. So you can see these viral particles and they kind of have this halo around them. Hence they were called when they were first seen coronaviruses because this virus has a corona. Those things you're seeing around the core of the virus is that spike protein. It is so large and so prominent that it hangs off the, uh, the virus in that way. So here's how SARS-CoV-2 actually replicates itself in human cells. And this is a cartoon. I'll be using uh, a lot of cartoons tonight to sort of explain the complex biology here. Over on the left, you can see a SARS-CoV-2 viral particle. It's labeled number one. In this case, it has already attached to the outside of a cell. This little barrier here, you can see is a cell membrane, and hopefully you can see my, my pointer moving around, as well as Zoom's gonna allow me to show that. Uh, it has already attached, and it is going to pull itself into the cell. And when it does so, it creates what we call a vesicle right here. So this is actually part of the cell's membrane that's been stuck around the outside of that virus. And what the virus will do once it gets inside of the cell is sort of puncture and merge with that membrane and then open itself up. And when it does, when it does open itself up and unfold in that matter, the genome, that genomic material that's inside the virus is released into the cell. Now, this is an RNA virus and RNA is normally found in our cells. It's how our cells send instructions, how the nucleus of our cells sends instructions out to the rest of the cell saying, make something, a protein typically. So the RNA is released from this virus and it's an instruction that the cell will then act on, not knowing that it's not a cellular RNA. It just sort of masquerades as a cellular RNA. So the cell, not knowing any better, starts making viral proteins and copying this genome, making more and more copies of the genome, making more and more proteins until the cell literally, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, is just taken over by this whole act. But the process ends with a new virus being produced and then released. And in reality, it's not just one virus, it's hundreds or thousands of viruses released from an infected cell after a successful infection. So this is what all viruses are after, their own replication. Here are some other uh, micrographs that show you what it looks like. Here you can see a cell, it's a relatively damaged cell, but look at how many viral particles are packed into the cell. It's just a ridiculous number. These, uh, these cells just become virus machines. So the virus is, is in essence, through use of that messenger RNA, its RNA genome, has forced the cell to do nothing but make more viruses. So that, that's how they work. So at this point, 
we're going to talk about something that I know is on people's minds and scientific community has sort of been joking about this. So we're getting so many questions about variants. We're now going to call them scariants because in many cases they're scary in the way they're portrayed to the public, but it's just a natural evolving form of the virus. So let's talk about a few terms that'll, that'll educate you about how this works. If someone says that they have a viral isolate, that means that they don't just have the genome or the sequence of a virus, but they have the actual virus. Like it's in a, in a tube in their freezer and they could go grow it in a cell culture somewhere. An isolate is an actual virus. It doesn't mean just the genome. Uh, if someone says a variant, a variant is simply a virus whose genome sequence is different from some other sequenced virus. So the one we generally refer to is the original sequence that was published when COVID-19 was first described in China. When it was in China, it was sequenced. That published, uh, that published sequence, its genomic sequence, became like the standard coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's its standard genome. Anything that is modified due to a mutation that normally happens as these viruses replicate themselves and make small mistakes when they do so, their genomic information changes. All those are called variants. So there are hundreds of thousands of sequences now published from viruses that have been isolated all over the world. And we can compare those and see what's going on. And so what you're seeing now is some press uh, that's probably not incredibly accurate overall, but it is reflective of the fact that scientists are monitoring SARS-CoV-2 to see if it is mutating in a way and if any of these variants become variants of concern. And I've listed some of the variants there. You can see a South African name and a Brazil, United Kingdom, and even one here in California. If they are uh, associated with a change in behavior, then we might call it a variant of concern. And that just means there's something about this variant that causes us either epidemiologically, that means like how is this thing spreading, patho pathologically, what kind of diseases are calling, or immunologically, is it different with respect to vaccines we're producing? If one of those things changes and we're worried about it or we're just investigating it, you could call it a variant of concern. Now, the other word that gets thrown out here all the time is strain. And frankly, that is a very significant term in the scientific community. That basically means that not only do you have a variant from that original type that you found, but it has unique and new characteristics. Like maybe it has a large protein rearrangement that totally changes the way one step of that virus replication works. That would probably be called a new strain, but only after an international committee of virologists basically voted on it to say, yeah, that's a new strain. And we do that deliberately because um, research-wise, it would be utter confusion if every variant ended up being called a strain and therefore worthy of its own study. So this is all set up for, for scientific and medical clarity, but the common press that's out there uh, often trying to scare people uh, because it's part of the business model is making these variants into scariants. So I hope my little description there sort of cleared that up and helped a little bit. Let's talk about the disease. You've probably heard about some of this before, so I'll go through it quickly. This, there's a lot of information on this image, so I'm just gonna show, uh, really show you the big pictures here. On the top, you can see healthy lung. So this is, if you look over on the left, there's a little picture of there's someone's lungs. And what we're looking at here, are these alveoli, and that's going all the way deep, all the way down, far as your lung, as far in your lung as air goes. These are those little air sacs way at the end of your trachea and your bronchia and your bronchioli. Finally, you get to these little air sacs. This is where the oxygen you breathe and the air you breathe actually gets to your red blood cells and is exchanged. So this first little picture up at the top, this first little blow up shows you here's this alveolus and here's the blood flowing around it in this nice little uh, capillary blood vessel and oxygen is going from the uh, inside of the little air sac into the red blood cell and carbon dioxide is being released by that red blood cell and released back here so that you can exhale it. This is how we do oxygen exchange over these epithelial membranes in our lungs. That's how they should work when they're healthy. But if these become infected, because these are the type of cells that line, that line these air sacs that can be infected by SARS-CoV-2. So 
Here's a picture of the virus. This one's kind of in 3D. You can see the genome and the cutaway there in the middle. The virus is gonna to attach to those cells, start infecting them. They're gonna start becoming those viral factories and the body's immune system is gonna notice. And when it notices, uh, some of these cells are not acting right and sending out signals that, you know, something's wrong with me, something's wrong with me. Fluid and immune cells will start to build up here and the blood flow and the area between um, the alveoli and the, and the capillary may grow and the oxygen and carbon dioxide can't be exchanged as well. And basically this is the beginning of a pneumonia process that eventually fills up those little air sacs with protein rich fluid. And it's coming from seepage from your blood and it's coming from the immune reaction and your body is basically trying to heal itself but in the process, you lose some lung capacity. And so the process of COVID-19, the disease, is this filling up of the lungs. This is the most uh, dangerous part of that condition and that disorder. And this is what we're trying to avoid with a vaccine. So that gives you some idea of the disease. This is another image I threw in here. You can probably look at this later and just see, this is some more details about the immune system function that's going on inside of the sick alveoli as you're looking here on the right or the healthy here on the left. That should look on, like the one on the left with a little bit of immune activity and a lot of airspace, but when it's infected, it looks more like the one on the right. So I'm not gonna go into any more detail on that one. Um, we know some things about this disease that I can, that I can share and some, some interesting parts you've probably already seen. We know that uh, the majority of cases we're seeing in the country and this is actually some older data, but the curve is the same, is occurring among young people. Um, the percent of cases is predominantly young people, but the deaths are heavily focused on the aged. It is uh, becoming a little more clear why that happens. It looks like some folks who are uh, older, maybe 75 or 80, are experiencing um, an immune response to one of the other coronaviruses. So in other words, their body sees that coronavirus and says, oh, I've seen you before. And it mistakes the new coronavirus for one of those old cold viruses and it starts mounting an attack on the old cold virus. Unfortunately, the old cold virus isn't there, it's the new one. And this is, uh, this is one potential cause for this, uh, for this uh, unusual focus here on the most aged. And of course, as a result of this peculiarity of the virus, we're seeing an awful lot of deaths in, uh, in nursing homes. So this is uh, similar data to what I just showed you. You can see cases are really different from deaths. Cases are represented in the graph on the left, and that pattern is really different from where people are dying and what ages they're, they're dying. We have extraordinarily few um, folks who have died as a, as a result of COVID-19 who are under the age of 18. I think the number I saw today in California was literally zero. So it's not at all uh, dangerous for kids, uh, at least to a very, very, very little extent compared to the risk that it presents for someone who is over the age of 80. I'm just gonna skip that. Let's go to testing. Uh, so we've covered this last time. I'm just gonna cover it again. More people are getting tested. I encourage you to get tested if you think you've been exposed or if you're worried that you have it and you're worried about, you know, should I be, uh, sequestering myself somewhere to keep myself uh, or my family safe. Remember, there are three kinds of tests. There are molecular tests that are looking for the RNA or the DNA of the virus. This is also referred to as PCR. If you get one of these tests, uh, it means you either have an infection or you had an infection because these tests will stay positive long after you've cleared the actual infection of COVID-19. If you get an antibody test, it depends on what type of antibody they're measuring, but generally that means you were more recently infected. The molecular test may last even longer. Uh, it's a little unclear now, but the antibody test is also saying you have had COVID-19. Uh, most likely the antibody test is not positive until after you've passed the, the symptoms of the disease. And then finally, there's the antigen test. And the antigen test is the least specific it has the most errors associated with it, but it does say that there are the, you have viral proteins in your nose, for example, if it's based on a nose swab. So if you need that quick 
uh, test to determine whether you've been exposed or you might be sick or currently have it. The antigen test is generally the way to go. I would leave the other two for more of a, a medical sort of environment where they need uh, more clarity in terms of treating you or, or dealing with something else. I'm gonna give you an update on the pandemic and where we are. I hope that you've uh, found these sorts of data online. This is from the Sacramento County Public Health Office. And this is a curve, the big thing right here in the middle that shows us how many cases we've had by date. So all the way over at the left and down at the bottom, you can see that was about a year ago, February of 2020. We had no cases. And then we had sort of what's been described as our first wave, that's the first little bump. And that probably peaked at the end of March. Then we uh, got all sorts of lockdown measures in place. And then we had our second peak, or our second wave. That peaked in July of 2020. And uh, as you remember, we did you know, further lockdowns and shutdowns and all sorts of things, trying to keep those numbers under control. And then finally, a big outbreak began in October of 2020. And that has now resolved basically until now, when we're getting back to similar numbers to where we were in October. Uh, of 2020. So we've gone through this third wave, which was really a giant wave. And I have heard virologists talking about how this coronavirus may very well be sort of a winter season virus. Uh, people have attributed this big wave to all sorts of things, gatherings at Thanksgiving and Christmas, people getting tired of the restrictions and, and doing things that weren't as safe, perhaps, as they should have been. But in all likelihood, there's also some environmental factors that make the virus more likely to spread during the winter. And that's what could have caused this big wave. So wait and see, we need a few more years to, to really sort that out. We've had about 1,400, almost 1,500 deaths so far in Sacramento County. And we've probably had 100,000 cases or thereabouts. If you look at it, you can also go to that website at Sacramento County, uh, just look for their COVID-19 dashboard and get all sorts of additional information. You can look at cases by age. Here's that same curve like I saw before, who's actually getting the virus and, and testing positive with it. Uh, they will also give you some ethnicity data about uh, you know, are certain races getting it at a rate greater than others. And you can also get death statistics along the same line. And you can see that for whatever reason, women are um, slightly more likely to be diagnosed with it and men are slightly more likely to have died by it. So make of that what you will. Here is the statewide view as of today. You can see Sacramento County, we are still in this purple zone. We have some surrounding counties that have gotten to the red and a couple in the state have gotten to the orange. And all of us are trying to follow those guidelines with regard to youth sports and hopefully reopening schools that probably should have been reopened a while ago. But um, getting those things done based on the state requirements and the requirements to, to maintain as much safety as possible. Um, and be aware of, of how this virus spreads and what things are advised and not advised. But that's available through the COVID-19 dashboard for the state of California. There are similar curves you can find there that show you positive cases. And boy, this kind of looks, this is the statewide data, kind of looks like what we saw here in Sacramento, very similar curve. And here's a death curve also from them, which shows the number of deaths, which is still, uh, still reasonably high even now. All right, let's get to the main part of the event, which is vaccines. Um, I'm gonna dive into this with a little story. And I hope, I really hope that some of you guys have heard this little story before. So the year is uh, 1796. And I hope that some of you recognize the, the physician sitting there. That is Dr. Edward Jenner. And he is performing his first vaccination against smallpox. Smallpox was a disease that killed 20 to 60% of its victims. You have to think about that. You get a disease, it disfigures you the way chickenpox does, but it also kills 20 to 60% of the people who it infected. So that was a very dangerous disease. If you think about uh, COVID-19 and our death rate in the United States now is probably under 1%, this killed 20 to 60 times as many, uh, as many people who were infected with it. So what Dr. Jenner noticed, and he wasn't frankly the first to notice it, but he was the first to try it in this way. He noticed that milkmaids, you know, the, the girls usually who were employed to milk cows in England were not getting uh, smallpox. They would get cowpox, which was a disease of the cow, it would be found on the udder of the cow when they were milking. 
they would sometimes get blisters on their hands, cowpox, and it kind of looked like smallpox. It was just a minor infection though. And so what he found out, and based on some other things that were happening about him, is that you could take, and this may be gross, he could take the pus from the cowpox, the little liquid that's inside one of those little blisters of cowpox, and scratch it into the skin of, uh, of a kid, in this case, James Phelps, and, or Phipps, I think his name was, maybe it was Phipps, um, scratch that into his skin and he would then be protected against smallpox. And we could never do this experiment now, but what he did a few months after this was expose that kid to smallpox because there was another uh, practice going on at the time called variolation where they would literally deliberately infect kids with smallpox because they knew that, well, if they're young and if they're healthy and if they just get a little bit of smallpox, they'll survive. But that particular process probably killed 2% of the kids who were getting that form of, it wasn't really a vaccine, but that form of treatment for smallpox. And he discovered that there's a better way. And the virus involved here is called uh, vaccinia rather. And that's what gives us the name for vaccines. So we have a lot to, we owe Dr. Jenner in this. And now we can, we can talk about some of the things that have happened since then. So first of all, let's say, what is a vaccine? And I'm going to give you a biologist's definition. A vaccine is a biological preparation that provides active acquired immunity to a particular infectious disease. So it's something biological that we give you that causes your immune system to recognize and be able to fight off a particular infectious disease. So vaccines typically contain agents that resemble the microorganism and are often made from weakened or killed forms of the microbe. So in that example I just gave you, he was giving one form of a virus from the cow to protect against the more dangerous form of the virus that was in humans. And the one conferred protection to the other. That's a vaccine by this definition. So then the next question is, well, what is immunity? You just said immunity. Well, in biology, immunity is the capability of a multicellular organism to resist harmful microorganisms. So a multicellular organism is anything with more than one cell. We certainly qualify. Uh, everything we'd call an animal or frankly, even a plant uh, qualifies as being multicellular. So in biology, immunity is the capability of those more complex organisms to resist harmful microorganisms like fungi or bacteria uh, or viruses. So immunity usually has both very specific, in other words, uh, focused means of fighting those microorganisms and non-specific components. So if you look at the organs of the immune system over here on the left, you're gonna see tears. That's non-specific. That just sort of cleans your eyes and any microorganism gets in your eyes, helps wash them out. Um, it has skin listed because your skin is a barrier against letting microorganisms into your body. It has mucus listed because all of our, you know, our elementary canal from our mouth, our nose, our lungs, all lined with mucus as a form of protection against those same microorganisms from getting into our body. So all those are part of our immune system that are not specific. They just fight any kind of microorganism. But we also have specific components, which are things like antibodies or uh, immune system cells that are specifically designed to go hunt out those microorganisms or their infected cells and kill them off. So we have specific and non-specific part of our immune system. So let's just go through some very basics of how a vaccine works and how we develop immunity. So this is a great series of images here from uh, Nature Magazine, which is a, probably the premier science publication in the United Kingdom. And I've just sort of cut this up into little pieces so it's understandable. So how do we develop immunity? Well, here's our friend, the coronavirus. And you can see there's its spike protein and some other proteins, its membrane protein, and there's its genome, the RNA on the inside of it in this cartoon. And in this cartoon, this coronavirus is about to infect this cell. So it gets into the body, you know, it's inhaled in a droplet, whatever. And it finds a cell that has the right kind of receptor on it, this ACE2 receptor. That's the kind of uh, receptor you're gonna find lining your, your lungs and your nose and, and other places in your body. Um, so that virus finds there and it latches on. It latches on with that spike protein to the ACE2 receptor. So it's now bound. And as we continue on with the story here, 
it enters the cell, sort of as I showed you in that replication cycle earlier. It enters the cell and there it is in that vesicle that I described and it ruptures, it manages to rupture that vesicle and out comes that RNA, out comes that genome. Uh, and there it is in the cell and the cell immediately says, hey, those are instructions to build something. And the cell follows the instructions and ends up building parts to make more viruses. And this is where the cell is basically taken over by that virus. And sure enough, the cell starts assembling more viruses here by number four and a number five, there we go. Now we're releasing new viruses out into the body to infect yet more cells and make yet more viruses. So this is uh, what the virus set out to do. And in this cartoon, it has achieved it. So the question is, where's the immune system come in? So here we go, here's the immune response. Well, one of the things that's gonna happen when that cell becomes infected is it may notify uh, by releasing certain chemicals or hormones, uh, or pro I'm sorry, proteins that will notify the rest of the body and specifically the immune system that I've got a problem. There's something wrong with me, I'm sick. The cell may even choose to die as a result and sort of spill its contents. All of those things lead to inflammation or immune response. And this is showing you one form of it. So here we have an antigen presenting cell, I call it an APC, and that cell is part of the immune system and it comes along in this situation and says, hey, something is not right. I'm seeing something on the surface of this cell or I'm seeing these viral particles that don't belong here. That is not part of my body. So it takes those, um, it takes those viruses and it takes apart the proteins and it puts them on its surface and it then bumps into other parts of the immune system. In this case, it's a, called a T helper cell. That T helper cell basically memorizes what that thing looks like, what that protein looks like that this antigen presenting cell is showing it. So the antigen presenting cell has picked up that virus, tears it apart, and it starts showing off, hey, here are the parts to it. The T helper, helper cell says, oh, okay, I got it. That's a part, that's a problem. And it does two things. These T helper cells inform other cells called B cells to make antibodies. I'm sure you've all heard about antibodies. Antibodies are these little Y-shaped proteins and they are specifically designed to latch on to something. Um, and your body in this, in this case, these T cells, these B cells are deciding what exactly they're going to attack and latch on to. And then these B cells make a bunch of antibody that are specific for that particular protein. It's probably something on the surface of this, um, of this virus and it creates those antibodies and they surround the virus. You can imagine it that way. You can also imagine them blocking the uh, adhesion of that virus to other cells. That's one arm of the immune system. The other arm of the immune system, again, from the T helper cells, tells something called cytotoxic T cells. And I, I should mention, I'm simplifying things here just to make it more understandable. This is an extraordinarily complex cascade of events. But these cytotoxic T cells actually go on the hunt for cells in your body that have been infected with, uh, with something that doesn't belong there. In this case, it would be SARS-CoV-2. So these cytotoxic C cells, having learned from the T helper cell what the problem is, go looking for that. And if they find a cell that has that problem on it, they kill them. Now, over time, um, the body will beat out you know, the virus. Let's assume there's a positive outcome. And we do not keep making the same level of antibody forever because we have these wonderful adaptions called memory cells where some of these B cells end up being memory cells and they remember, you know, if I ever see one of those proteins again from that coronavirus, I know which antibody to make. And so we have those long lived B cells that hang out in our body, basically for every microbe we've ever come across, we probably have some B cells hanging out in us that remember how to fight that. Our level of antibody will go down because those microbes aren't around anymore. But if they show up again, these B cells will snap back into action. They'll make a bunch of copies themselves and, and duplicate themselves a lot and start cranking out the antibody again. They're pre-programmed basically to fight whatever they learned the first time. Same thing for these cytotoxic C cells. We get these long lived memory cells that will recognize the virus and they can hang out in your body for months or years. And this is what is the basis for specific immunity. It's those long lived cells. When they're active here, that's during the disease process, but as soon as that's over, we're into the memory zone. So this is the goal of a vaccination. 
to give us all these memory cells so that if we ever see that pathogen again, that microbe, our bodies will be ready to snap into action and produce antibodies and cytotoxic cells and fight that infection so that we don't actually develop a disease. Uh, I think I'll skip that. We have developed so many uh, vaccines. This is a list I actually got from the CDC today. And you can see the ones on the left are sort of recommended for everybody. And you, you see all sorts of diseases that you recognize, chickenpox, diphtheria, flu, hepatitis A, B, uh, human papillomavirus, measles, mumps, polio, rotavirus, rubella, shingles, tetanus, whooping cough. And on the right, those are some slightly more specialized vaccines that you might get if you travel or if you're in a particular situation. Or, you know, a smallpox are really are not necessary anymore because we've eradicated smallpox due to our success with vaccines. So we've, we've made a lot of vaccines and we can even see how effective our vaccines are. This is a uh, from a pretty current publication from the CDC. And you can see a list here of diseases, smallpox, diphtheria, measles, and the number of annual cases or morbidity you would have seen in the 20th century. So just in the 20th century, for example, we could see 30,000 cases of smallpox a year. And now in 2016, how many cases do we have a year? Zero. The vaccine is that effective. Same thing for diphtheria, 21,000, zero. Look down here, polio, paralytic polio. 20th century, we might see 16,000 cases a year. You imagine 16,000 paralyzed kids a year? Current number, zero. The amount of uh, positive effect that vaccines have had on our lives is massive and probably uh, overlooked. I mean, many of us have lived our entire lives not worried about anything on this list. So a lot of these diseases are just about eliminated. Polio um, and smallpox is eliminated worldwide. Polio is about to be eliminated worldwide. All right, so let's talk about different types of vaccines because there are a lot of ways to give and or to create a vaccine and to give it to an individual. So this is a complicated chart and I'm gonna go into each one of these a little more specifically in describing different kinds of vaccines. So first up, you can see a nucleic acid vaccine. So this kind of vaccine just contains the genome or part of the genome, usually just a focused part of the genome of that microorganism. Uh, it's, it, it's made of DNA or RNA. RNA are the ones that we're gonna focus on today because that's what we've actually developed. And these are really quick and easy to design. Um, I think the Moderna RNA vaccine that's out there now was literally designed in about 48 hours after the sequence of of SARS-CoV-2 was published. So they can really be designed quickly. Um, this chart says they've never been done before, but now we can say that's a little out of date because it has been done before. We have two uh, RNA vaccines, <coughs> excuse me, that are out there and available. Now there are other ways to make vaccines and frankly, some of these are messier. These uh, virus vaccines, <clears throat> usually contain either a whole virus that's been inactivated, so virus vaccines inactivated. This is when you take a, 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 healthy vac a healthy virus and you inactivate it by treating it with heat or acid or something, and you inactivate it to the point that it can't make copies of itself anymore, it can't replicate, and you use that whole process as a vaccine. Um, that requires a lot of testing. It is safe because the virus is dead, but it's not as effective as a live virus. And so the other alternative, if you're gonna use a whole virus, is to make a live virus vaccine or a live attenuated virus vaccine. And in this case, you're, making, you're taking a virus that's dangerous and you're dumbing it down. You're weakening it. So um, while it still is like the actual virus, it can't cause the disease um, the way the regular virus can. And then you end up using that as the vaccine. So an example of a live attenuated virus vaccine is measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox. All those vaccines use those actual viruses that have just been dumbed down to the point that they can't create a disease, but they can give you and your immune system enough information to mount uh, an immune response against the real deal if you get it. The inactivated, polio is probably the best example of an inactivated virus vaccine that's out there. 
An yet another approach is a protein approach. And these are pretty popular. There are quite a few vaccines based on this approach. In this case, you don't worry about the genome of the, of the organism or the entire virus. You just look at the proteins of interest. So in, in the case of coronavirus, they'd be taking that spike protein and chopping it up and trying to inject enough spike protein into us that our body would say, hey, that's foreign, and then make a, uh, an immune response against it. This can be very effective. It's been used for pertussis, hepatitis C, human papillomavirus. And finally, we have the viral vector approach. Now this one is a little more complicated, but pretty cool. In this case, you take a, a virus that is not dangerous. So say like an adenovirus that I mentioned earlier, adenoviruses really don't cause us disease, but what you do is in the genome of the adenovirus, you insert a little bit of the instructions that would make that protein of interest for the microorganism you're targeting. So for example, you would probably put the spike gene, part of the genome in there so that the adenovirus would be carrying the spike gene or the instructions on how to make the spike protein of coronavirus to your cells. And that virus would, that viral vector would go into your body, infect a cell, cause that uh, little bit to be expressed, and then you'd mount an immunity against it, but it wouldn't actually cause you any disease. So these have been used for trying to make an Ebola uh, vaccine and a lot in veterinary medicine. So let's look at these examples a little bit more. First up, we've got the nucleic acid vaccines, and these are definitely the hot vaccine of the moment. They use genetic instructions in the form of RNA or DNA, and the ones that are on the market now that we'll talk about are RNA. That RNA takes the form of messenger RNA that I've that I have mentioned here before. You inject that messenger RNA basically into muscle cells in your body, and the body says, oh, there's messenger RNA here, I'm gonna act on it. Your body makes the protein that is specified in that messenger RNA, and then uh, expresses that, those proteins become visible on the outside of the cell because the cell has just been tricked into making it from the vaccine. And then your immune response says, hey, those don't belong there and mounts an immune response against those odd proteins that came from the coronavirus, but were carried there solely by messenger RNA. This is, these vaccines have been used before in animals, never before in humans until this year was this technology um, applicable to a vaccine creation. So we have the very first messenger RNA, mRNA vaccines available through the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines this year. It's extremely exciting. And it is part of the reason why these vaccines came so quickly. Second option that I mentioned to you before was using the whole virus, a virus vaccine. These are either the weakened virus, you can see an example of it here in the cartoon on the left, or in an activated virus, the weakened one can't really cause disease. Uh, the inactivated one's been treated with something, so it's not gonna work right. They also mount an immune response. I think the only uh, vaccine that uh, you may have heard about that's being produced this way is Sinovac, and that is a Chinese company. They have, they have developed this type of vaccine. This is a little bit of the old school way of, of making a vaccine. It works, but uh, is probably not as effective, certainly, as the um, nucleic acid vaccines I just showed you before. Third up on our list was protein-based vaccines, and these are popular and will remain popular. And, oops, I've got a typo on this slide. Um, protein subunits are uh, like the spike protein. You would generate a whole bunch of those, inject those into cells and into your body and hope that the immune response was mounted against those cells. I have labeled down here, Pfizer and Moderna are this type, that is not accurate. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna are the nucleic acid type vaccine. So this is also a very common way, uh, but it can be challenging because if you don't choose the right protein or the right protein subunit, the body may not make much of an immune response against it, or that immune response may not be effective in fighting that COVID uh, infection. So. Moving on, we can talk about finally the viral vector vaccines. These are pretty cool. This is when you take uh, a virus like a weakened measles or a adenovirus and you insert into their genome the little bit of spike gene you want from coronavirus. 
So those viruses get into your cells. They uh, instruct your cells to make some of this protein. That happens, um, or in some cases, the virus can actually replicate itself a little bit in your cells. In any case, that coronavirus spike protein ends up being the main agents against which your body mounts an immune response. And this is the Johnson & Johnson type approach. They are using an adenovirus, it's called adenovirus 26, as the basis for their technology. It will not make you sick, that adenovirus, and it carries the gene for the spike protein of coronavirus, and that is the basis for its um, creation of immunity in individuals. So very exciting. <clears throat> we should talk a little bit about the steps of vaccine development. So I wish I could have found a better graphic than this one. I really didn't have time to make one. I probably could if I set my mind to it, but let's just talk about the steps because they are complex. And this sort of gives you the idea of what is typical. You know, so first, number one there, you've got to do research to figure out what microorganism are you going after? What strategy are you going to pursue? You want to do some, some tests in animals to figure out, you know, is it this part of the protein or that part of the protein that you mount a better immune response against? And does that have the right effect during an infection? So there's years of research, usually two to four years of research. And under an accelerated scenario, you might be able to do that in six months. Now, I'll, I'll say this accelerated does not match what just happened. We're even more accelerated than accelerated in, uh, in what we just did for the SARS coronavirus. So um, the second step is preclinical preparation. That usually takes a couple of years. That's when you're figuring out what exactly am I gonna put into this vaccine? How am I gonna prepare it? Uh, what form is it gonna take? How much of a dose do I need? Then you have to do clinical trials. And that's when you actually inject it into people. First, just a little bit to see how much, the, just a few people, just to see what kind of dose do I need. And then the clinical trials can get extremely large. Uh, in the case of these vaccines that were just um, done last year, we're talking about 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 people being involved in clinical trials. Uh, after the clinical, and there are three phases of clinical trials. Um, conveniently labeled one, two, and three. <laughs> phase one, phase two, phase three. After all of that, and now notice that if you're adding up the years here, it's like four and two is six and five is 11. Then you have to go to the FDA and get approval. That usually takes a year. Then you have to manufacture your virus. That can take a couple of years to get up and running and gain FDA approval for the manufacturing. And then finally, you have to distribute it. So if you add all this up, typical vaccine could take 14 years. A uh, typical vaccine might cost a billion dollars to develop, in part because these clinical trials, if you're following the medical history of 30,000 people, that is a substantial effort. You know, those, those people are probably coming to the clinic once a month, and you have to pay doctors and nurses to see them and do tests on them and follow them for years afterwards. It's an extraordinary burden, uh, clinical trials. Necessary, it's just expensive. So that leads to the question, was this vaccine rushed? Were these vaccines rushed? Are these vaccines unsafe because of that? And the answer is no, these are safe and effective vaccines and I'll tell you why. I just described to you the typical vaccine research program. What we did this past year happened so quickly because of the enormous number of dollars that were spent in a short period of time. It is unprecedented for someone to say, I told you that would probably cost a billion dollars to you over that time period. It's unprecedented for someone to say, well, let's just do that all right now, as quickly as we can, unlimited budget, go do it. That's never happened. That's in essence never happened. And you have multiple governments pursuing this. So it's not, it's mainly the United States, but also other countries, I'll show you in a second, are, are contributing here. So the process was quick because of all those dollars being spent. Um, if you had applied that to other uh, vaccine developments before, you would have seen faster development processes there too. That doesn't mean that uh, corners were cut or anything dangerous was done here. The other thing that really factored into these vaccines being done so quickly is newer technology. Now, certainly newer technology for the mRNA that I described, those two vaccines that, were, that use the mRNA, they have uh, been postulated for 20 years, I think, in humans. Uh, done before an animal successfully, this is the first application to humans. It's a very pure type of vaccine. It has very 
uh, low number of potential complications and incredibly effective as we've seen. So that, that new technology also sped up how fast we were able to develop these vaccines. The other thing I would say to, to, you know, to point out that they're safe and effective is that millions of people have now had these vaccines and the side effects are extremely rare and frankly, uh, pretty minor. So these are safe and effective vaccines and I wholeheartedly endorse them. You know, and if you've, if you've gotten one of these vaccines, there's even an app that the CDC will use to follow you after you've had it, into which you can report your symptoms. You know, if you have soreness at the site of infection, uh, for example, or a little achiness or something like that, you report that into this app or through a website at the CDC. And these are the most studied vaccines in human history. So these are very safe and effective vaccines. Now, I thought it was interesting to see who's actually putting up all that money for the research on the vaccine. So here, here's the answer to that question. And this is analysis that was done uh, last September. I could not find one more recent, but I assume these trends are, um, are accurate and probably still largely this case. This is not production of vaccine. This is not manufacturing of vaccine or, or licensing costs. This is all research and development. So this is how much did, uh, did different governments spend trying to develop vaccines. So you can see the United States is the world leader, uh, $2.6 billion spent on vaccine research. That's what made it go so fast. Next country, Germany, almost a billion dollars spent in Germany developing um, coronavirus vaccines. United Kingdom comes in third, almost half a billion dollars. Uh, Norway, I'm not sure why Norway shows up so high on this list, but there they are, 214 million followed by the European Commission. As you go down the list, China's way down here, only 141 million. Of course, they've only got, I think, the one uh, vaccine under development that may have something to do with it. But in any case, United States is the world leader in medical research and in medical care. And in this case, you can see uh, the amount of resources we're able to pour into research and development and in a successful way. So uh, that was a question about, are these vaccines safe? There's also a lot of questions out there about immunity and herd immunity, and what does that mean? So I've got a little graphic here, and I hope it works. I hope it works through Zoom. Um, this is a little demonstration of herd immunity. Now, basically, what herd immunity means, and you know, there's a lot of controversy and confusion about it. Herd immunity means so many. Herd immunity means so many people have been vaccinated in a population that the virus really doesn't have any new victims to go to, that it can successfully replicate itself. And so it's sort of stymied in the spread. So as you look at this chart here, you can see in the upper left, no one's been vaccinated in this particular case. And hopefully when I hit play here, you'll see the, uh, the virus spread. Um, and then you've got in the center top, 25% vaccination, 50% vaccination, 75% vaccination here on the bottom left, and then all the way bottom right, all the way up to 95% vaccination. So in this particular case, that darkest dot, that darkest colored dot there, that's the infected person. The blues, uh, the everyone here in the upper left, for example, that color is the unvaccinated. And then finally, uh, the last color here, that is the vaccinated or the people who can't be infected. So if I hit play, let's see how the virus spreads from the dark dot uh, to the blue dots. There you go, you see it's spreading like crazy. And I'm gonna pause it right there. So this is an example of someone where a uh, situation where no one's vaccinated and the virus can just spread to everyone. So it does over time. And you know, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 is not spreading this fast, but given enough time it would, it would look like that. And then look at the gradations here, 25%, 50%, 75%, boy, we have really slowed down how many people have gotten this virus. I like the little lines there showing how it spread from person to person. 90%, almost no spread. Uh, and the 95%, I think it infected one person that it had access to. That's how herd immunity works. Not everyone, not 100% of people need to be vaccinated in order for the entire population by and large to be protected from a given virus. And that's important because some people can't get the shot. They can't be immunized for whatever reason. Maybe they have another medical condition. Uh, maybe they're immunocompromised. But that means the rest of us need to be immunized and to have immunity to protect those who can't be immunized. 
because otherwise they could succumb to the virus. There it goes again. That's really cool. All right. Um, herd immunity thresholds then are the question, what percent people do you have to have vaccinated in order to get that herd immunity and be able to protect all those folks? Well, every disease, every virus, you can assign what's called a basic reproduction number. In other words, how likely is that thing to, to spread and infect someone else? And you can see the numbers here on our chart go from like 1.5 all the way up to 18. Well, measles is kind of a renowned spreader. You know, there's a story about uh, an individual walked through an emergency room and the individual had measles. They walked through all the patients in the emergency room and out in the waiting room. And over time, 95% of the people in the waiting room got measles because measles just spreads like crazy. That virus is perfect for spreading. It's ideal. So its reproduction number is really high. And as a result, if you want to protect people against measles, if you want to protect your population against measles, you've got to have 90 or 92 to 95% of them with a vaccine or some form of immunity. Smallpox doesn't spread quite as well. You only need 80%. And you can see the various results are polio. You need about 80 or 86%. SARS, the original one, we figured we were going to need 50 to 80%. Ebola, it doesn't spread so well, actually. It kills a lot of people. It'll, it'll infect, but it doesn't spread so well. You probably only need to vaccinate or have immunity of 33% or 60% of your people, and influenza is even less. So we don't know exactly where SARS-CoV-2 falls into the scale, but my guess is it's somewhere down here in this, in sort of this mumps or, or SARS realm. It's somewhere in that two to seven range. So that means our goal for vaccination is 75% might be a reasonable number, a reasonable goal. So uh, I'm going to answer some questions at this point, one of which is, which vaccine should I get? The answer is any of the approved vaccines that you can get. All of them uh, work effectively. And I know that will not satisfy everyone. So here's a little deeper dive into it. Uh, let's look at the COVID-19 vaccines that are available. So we've got the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. That is an mRNA. And all of you now know what that means, an mRNA vaccine type. You need to take two doses, probably about 21 days apart. It is about 95% effective in preventing uh, symptoms. And it is a little hard to keep because you got to freeze that RNA really hard or it will break down if it gets uh, warmed up. It's pretty fragile stuff. I know having worked with it in a, in a laboratory environment, um, mRNA is, uh, is difficult. It's challenging. Extremely effective as this vaccine, however. The Moderna, pretty much the same story. They did their study a little bit differently, so their doses are four weeks apart. Um, again, both of these, actually everything across the board here has 100% protection from hospitalization or, or death uh, in all the studies. Basically, no one with any of these vaccines died or had, had even to be hospitalized as a result of infection. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it has that adenovirus vector. That's where they put part of the, the coronavirus uh, protein being expressed inside that, that virus that doesn't make you sick. It had a 66%, now I'm hearing a lot about this, 66% rate of disease prevention. Well, actually, that number is probably not the best number. There are numbers ranging from 57% to I think 72% that try to measure this. The problem is each of these studies was designed measuring something slightly different. So Johnson & Johnson was trying to measure um, serious disease symptoms. Uh, Moderna and Pfizer were looking at, uh, frankly, more minor symptoms. But the basic bottom line, the measure by which we would judge all of these vaccines is the serious, you know, the very serious hospitalization or death prevention. So by that measure, all of them are effective. And then AstraZeneca, which I haven't talked about very much, it's also an adenovirus factor, although they have two doses about four weeks apart. Now there is speculation that Johnson & Johnson would have a better result had they had two doses. And that may be the case. I think they may have deliberately positioned themselves for one dose, because if you think about having to do these vaccinations around the world, a two dose regimen <clears throat> of a vaccine that you have to store at a freezing temperature is not simple. So maybe that was just a business decision. But in any case, all of these vaccines are good. So how do you get it? This is from our city's great website. Our city has an awesome COVID-19 resources website. I urge you all to look at it. 
Um, and there's, it's really confusing, perhaps trying to figure out how you get your vaccine. So here's three simple steps. One, figure out if you're eligible. So right now we are looking at people with great risk, uh, healthcare and congregate workers, first responders, teachers, childcare workers. If you are eligible to receive the vaccine, then you can go on to the next step. And over time, that age limit, that 65 year age limit will drop. So number two, if you're eligible, then stick with your healthcare provider. You know, if you're a Sutter patient, stick with Sutter. If you're a Kaiser patient, stick with Kaiser. Call your primary care provider. Or you can go sort of out of that system and look to the local pharmacy. So if you're eligible, stick with your own healthcare system, or maybe, you know, look outside, go to the pharmacy. You can register with the state. You can register with the county, ask to be notified. I think all of those things work. And if you aren't yet eligible, uh, sign up. It's myturn.ca.gov. They will let you know when you are eligible. And you can even get email updates from the county about when uh, when your age group is going to be eligible. So here, here's the summary again, and all of this information is, as I said, available on our great City of Rancho Cordova website about uh, vaccine information. So what's coming next? This is where I predict a little bit of what I think is coming around the corner. This vaccination campaign we're in is going to go on for a while. Uh, California had announced that we might get to healthy adults age 20 and up by August. I think they've now moved that up to July. And I just heard, was it today or yesterday, federal government's now estimating they may have enough vaccine by May to, uh, to vaccinate everyone. I think that was adding a second producer of the Johnson & Johnson style vaccine, that they may produce enough doses by May to vaccinate uh, everyone. So that's great. Uh, a little nuance a lot of people don't know yet is we don't have vaccine studies for kids. Those are, un those are uh, undergoing tests right now. The vaccines that have been produced are have been approved for use in kids either 16 or older or 18 and older, depending on the vaccine. So we don't have anything for kids under 16 yet. Now, the good news is, as I mentioned, there's not much illness there. There's not much chance, there's a very limited chance that they actually spread COVID. We haven't seen any outbreaks in schools that are open all over the country, except for California. So, you know, they are not at, at great risk, but also we don't have a vaccine for them yet and we, we will need one. Uh, finally, you're gonna be hearing more about antiviral drugs and therapy. So that's what I think is coming next. And of course, our old advice still matters, wash your hands, wear a mask, uh, I could joke about two masks, but I won't. <coughs> Follow all the safety guidelines out there. Don't forget to donate blood. People have quit donating blood and the healthcare system really needs it. And if you see fraudulent COVID-19 tests or vaccines or treatments, please blow the whistle and let us know. Let someone know in authority because that is a, that is a bit of a curse. There's a lot of fraud going on out there. All right. At this point, I think we are ready for questions. And if there aren't enough, I have a couple pre-prepared. I don't know, Shelly, well, no. if you're gonna join there, me. There, there's, some, uh, there's certainly some questions out here, David. And so I'll uh, go ahead and start um, uh, and uh, kind of grouping some together. For example, Cliff and Lucille have both kind of asked the same question. What about natural herd immunity developed from those who develop antibodies by having had the disease? And what is the estimated prevalence of asymptomatic persons in the US who never showed recognized symptoms of the infection? And just to extend that a little bit, at this point, Lucille asks, what, what about what percent of the total US population has immunity, either through vaccine or acquiring the virus? Any ideas on that? Yeah, that's a very, those are very good questions. Um, I could probably get a better estimate with time over what percent has been exposed. I've asked myself that question, but I haven't, haven't tried to figure it out or look it up yet. <clears throat> um, you know, we talk about perhaps 20% of our population has been vaccinated as, as, as high as that in some states. So you can sort of take that as a base and then assume that, uh, you know, everyone who got sick um, from this from this disease and Sacramento County numbers would suggest maybe one out of 15 people has been ill with uh, COVID. That's that's a reasonable estimate. So you could add another six or seven percent to that to that 20 numbers. So now we're up to 27, and then you got to assume that um, 
maybe you know one out of 15 knew they were sick, but we think about 40% of cases are asymptomatic. In other words, uh, out of 100 people getting it, 60% will realize they've had the disease, 40% will not. They'll be asymptomatic and just sort of like a carrier that, that spreads it but doesn't really get sick. So you could take that, that other number and, well, let's just double it for the point of the mass. So maybe now we're up, I'm just doing a back of the envelope calculation live here for you. Maybe we're up to a third of the population that has some uh, exposure at this point to the virus. That, that'd be my best estimate based on the Sac County um, numbers. Does that answer all, all the questions? Oh, I guess the other one is, it might actually be covered here in my, uh, in my six myths. Um, there are six myths about this vaccine that we hear a lot about. The first one is, you know, that this vaccine somehow alters DNA. Uh, no, that's just not true. mRNA doesn't go into the nucleus and doesn't change DNA. Uh, those other vaccines that use viruses that have DNA in them, the DNA does not change your body's DNA. It just, it doesn't work that way. That's a myth. <clears throat> uh, I covered the one that says it's not safe because it's too quick. Some people worry that people with food allergies or breastfeeding or pregnant can't get the vaccine. They actually can. You just need to talk to your doctor about under what circumstances you do that. There's a myth out there that you get COVID-19 from the vaccine. None of these vaccines have COVID-19 in them. So that's not, not possible. <clears throat> you know, a little bit of the genome is not going to gonna give you the, uh, the, vac the virus. There's a myth that I've had COVID-19, so I don't need the vaccine. That's probably, that's the closest to not being a myth. Because <clears throat> if you fought it off, you have successfully fought it off and mounted an immune response. The problem is you may have an immune response that's not ideal. That's kind of like a bad, you know, fought it off in a weak way. And the vaccine will give your, uh, your body an immune response that's powerful in comparison and strong. Uh, a, a more well-targeted one, I guess I could say. And so you still want to get the vaccine, even if you've had COVID-19. And then finally, there's no need for a mask or social distancing after the vaccine. That's a myth because you can actually still get it and spread it. We think we need more data on that because vaccines do not prevent you from getting the virus. They prevent you from getting sick. That's the point of the vaccine. Uh, little bitty infections occur and will have to occur before your body has enough time to mount the immune response to fight it off. So if during that time when that little infection is occurring, you can spread it, then that's why you need to keep wearing a mask. You might spread it while you have an infection you don't even know about before your body's able to fight it off. So okay. that might answer a couple more questions there, Shelly. Yeah. Um, here, here's one from Carol. Um, she uh, asks, um, can infection with COVID occur with just one virus particle invading, or does it require multiple particles? And then the multiple. second part to this question is, it is said the new <laughs> variants are more contagious. What exactly does that mean? Okay. So um, all viruses, There's. I'm trying to think of an example. I don't think there, there is a good example of a, any virus that we know of that's able to successfully sort of mount an infection in a, in a multicellular organism with just a single viral particle. That would be extraordinarily unlikely because so many of the particles won't work uh, and many of them will break or get killed off by that nonspecific immune response. So I shouldn't say killed, should I? Eliminated by that nonspecific non immune response. So um, it takes a lot. We don't actually know the dose number yet for uh, this coronavirus. It could very well be in the hundreds or you know, thousands of particles. Could be perhaps as low as several dozen, but that doesn't seem likely with this type of virus. So you need a decent exposure. And I think the way in which it's spread has sort of lent credence, credence to that. You know, um, kids, for example, if they were to be infected and in a school environment, child is simply smaller, doesn't breathe as much. It's probably putting out fewer droplets. That might be why we don't see it spreading at schools. You know, even in all the states where schools are open, you, we're not seeing school spread. That, that could be a, a significant factor why, that you need quite a bit of virus in order to infect someone else, which means you got to breathe in a lot of droplets from someone else and kids just don't produce enough. That's one line of thought there. Um, th was there a second part of that question, Shelly, that I didn't cover? Um, 
the um, the new variants when they say they're more contagious. Oh right. You mean what the do they scary? Mean by that? The scariants. <laughs> the scariants. Um, I had no idea yeah. you scientists were so clever this way. So funny. Oh, aren't we? Oh, just, boy, really you funny. guys are, you're a laugh riot, man. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's science humor for sure. Um, <laughs> so if, if there was a modification or a mutation, now that's a word, by the way, mutation. That's a word that the Hollywood has destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> Viruses in their uh, the very nature, they're so simple. They're such simple little machines. They make lots of mistakes when they copy their own genome. And so all these errors get thrown in there. And every once in a while, one of those errors actually improves something. But all of those errors are mutations. So mutations are just like a constant normal thing among viruses. And some viruses mutate lots more than others. Coronaviruses actually are probably one of the least uh, likely to mutate viral families. They have a lot of extra machinery that tries to replicate uh, accurately. So they don't mutate as well as other viruses. But because it's such a worldwide pandemic and there's so many viruses out there, odds are um, some of them could find an improvement in one of those mutations. So if we do have a variant of concern that is spreading uh, more rapidly than something else, what's probably happened is that something very slight has changed on that maybe, let's say the spike protein that makes it a little bit stickier to its receptor or a little bit more likely to be able to initiate that process of pulling into the cell or a little more likely uh, to avoid one of the other nonspecific immune barriers that your body puts up. So there's, there's probably just some slight little modification. And um, in these cases, these variants, you've seen them in South Africa, now in California, in the United Kingdom, it looks like from the original data, uh, and again, this could be wrong because science is constantly in, in an updating process. Um, it looks like they're able to spread a little more rapidly. So um, I'm speculating on what that might mean based on where those, uh, where those known mutations are that led to that variant of concern. But that's one example of how it might work. You're going to love this next question, David. It comes all the way from the land of Lincoln from your mother. <laughs> Oh, if no. one, yes. If one has had COVID-19, are both doses of vaccine needed? Some people have had the disease and one dose of the vaccine, which made them ill. So, so in other words, uh, does the, having, the vac, having the disease act as like your first dose, kind of? Yeah, the, not really, um, because your own body's response to the uh, virus is probably not the same response that the vaccine is gonna, going to teach your immune system. Uh, the vaccine is really targeted, for example, on a portion of that spike protein that's most obvious when the virus is floating around in the body. That seems like the most likely effective target. And your own immune system may have found a way to you know, design antibodies to attach to that virus, but it's not as effective as what the vaccine would give you it's possible you have a response that's more effective than what the vaccine would give you, but it, it's just sort of a roll of the dice. You don't know. Yeah. And so as a result, even people who've had COVID-19, we still urge to get um, the two shots. And I'll, I will caveat that a little bit. There's some early data now out of Israel that suggests that one shot of the MRNA vaccines give you 85% protection, which is pretty <laughs> remarkable. Um, but we don't know that to be the case yet. That, that will require more research to figure out. So the best advice right now is even if you've had COVID-19, um, still get both, both shots if you're going after those mRNA vaccines. Wonderful. Um, I'm looking that it's uh, 721, so we've kept you a little longer. But here's a really thoughtful question that maybe this is a good way to sort of wrap up. And that is from Rick. And he says, should we expect a new unknown virus in another hundred years? In other words, are we going to go through this again? Uh, well, you know, the scary part of this is, is that this is our third new coronavirus in the past dozen years. We've had MERS, the original SARS, and now SARS-2. Um, the likelihood that this could happen again, not necessarily with worldwide pandemic, but uh, another coronavirus erupting is pretty significant. 
And I think the way to protect ourselves against that is to invest in research that would develop either antivirals or uh, vaccines that would protect us against more coronaviruses. Such things have been possible, but no one's really ever put up the money to develop them. We could have, for example, better vaccines against influenza. We could have better vaccines against coronaviruses. And um, we just haven't put up enough resources to do it. You've seen now what we can do with those resources in a year. It's pretty remarkable. I would think that with the application of a few billion dollars, we could probably come up with the means of fighting a lot of potential um, damaging coronaviruses that might show up in coming years. There's no reason to, to think that the rate will decrease um, because humans continue to impact, you know, bat species that are that are all over the world and bats who migrate, uh, you know, thousands of miles uh, potentially. So, you know, that that contact and that appears to be the main reservoir for coronavirus. Um, those incidents are going to keep happening. So it may not, you know, the next one may not be one of these big pandemics. We certainly hope it isn't, but we should prepare as if it might be. That would be my advice. Two quick uh, wrap ups and um, then we're going to let everybody go and um, put their masks on and do whatever they do to stay safe, sa stay safe. But uh, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to combine these, David. F Sandy's asking, is there a waiting period to get the vaccine if you've had the virus? That's a good question. And then from Jim, um, this is an opportunity to, I think, underline what you said earlier. Uh, Jim asks, he says, we have received both of our vaccine doses. A vaccine is better than no vaccine. An EMT would probably not want a defibrillator that is 72% effective. <laughs> so why would a person want to be stuck with a vaccine that is only 72% effective? It depends what 72% effective means. Is it 72% effective at um, keeping you from serious symptoms? Because the, you know, that's, that's how it would be reported in a vaccine study. But if you saw the next line on the chart, it was what percent of deaths or hospitalizations were presented were, were prevented. And that was a hundred percent. So, you know, these are complicated studies with lots of different measures. And often it's like apples and oranges and bananas that they're measuring. Um, don't let that 72% number or the 95% number really sway your decision. The next line down that says how many hospitalizations or deaths does this, does this prevent a hundred percent. That's what we're really after. Um, and then you can, if that's still not quite enough for you, think in terms of herd immunity. You know, if enough people, let's assume we only had a vaccine that was 75% effective at preventing death, right? So still 25% of people would. If you had enough herd immunity, you could still stymie the virus and stop its spread. It's just a question of how many people are vaccinated. Okay. Don't let the uh, perfect or the perceived perfect be the enemy of the good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's uh, good advice. Um, well, uh, we've uh, probably uh, taken everybody's time and we could probably talk about this all night. It is the story of our lifetime for sure. Um, I just wanted to uh, wrap up, David, by saying thank you so much, how very informative this is. Several people have noted that they're glad it's been taped and that's a good reminder for me to say that once we have the recording ready to go, we'll send that link out to you so you can watch it again or um, send it on to someone you think would uh, like to have this same information. It was really top drawer. Um, also, um, just want to remind everybody watching that, you know, this is a evening edition of the Rancho Cordova Luncheon, but uh, we'd love you to remember to sign up for the regular Rancho Cordova Luncheon that's coming up on March 19th. Um, third Friday uh, of the month, as always. Uh, you'll really want to make sure uh, to get uh, to zoom in to hear uh, the latest on Rancho Cordova's evolving plans for what we expect will be a spectacular 
Rancho Cordova Civic Center. And David, I'm sure you would have comments on that too. So visit uh, ranchocordova.org, that's the Chamber's website, and follow the links that say events, so we can send you the link to be part of the Rancho Cordova Luncheon on March 19th. David also mentioned that everybody should be donating blood during this time. Just want to remind you that on March 12th, the Cordova Community Council is hosting a blood drive here at Rancho Cordova City Hall. Uh, if you need a link to uh, make an appointment for a blood drive, because you don't get our email, I can't imagine there's very many of you left. We have an awful lot of you on our email list, but we would uh, certainly welcome you and encourage you to sign up for some of the spots that are still left on March 12th. The um, blood drive will be here in Rancho Cordova City Hall, and you, they do encourage um, reservations, but uh, if you want, you can walk in and they can usually handle it. And so um, with that, um, Diane Rogers from the Chamber, is there anything you need to add, um, add to this before we let David go? I'll just say that one, my appointment is at 3.30 next Friday. So I'm excited about having the opportunity to give blood and do that good thing. David also mentioned, um, well, it's not related to the virus that there's a lot of fraud out there. So I just wanna just urge everyone to be extraordinarily careful about phone calls that don't sound right or letters that don't sound right, you know, please be diligent. And um, when the new checks and things start coming, you're going to get a whole surge of this. So I did put in the chat that if you uh, contact the Federal Trade Commission, that they have a lot of good information. But I just know this is a good audience. That it's, it's a lot of you out there today, and we're very grateful. So just be very, very careful of the fraud that does take place. Don't want to stop on a downer, but just want to be really careful out there. And I will also add that my pregnant daughter-in-law did get her shots and has mm -hmm. side effects. So those of you that have that concern and she's a nurse and uh, will soon be delivering our first grandchild. So it was a very healthy thing, that, a good choice I think that she made. So hopefully that will put some folks mind at ease. So thanks Shelly, yes. Okay, well, uh, thanks so much. We've had a, a audience from far and wide, uh, including uh, all the way to Illinois. And uh, we're just finding out about Madeline who heard something on KCRA News and is tuning in from Stevenson, California. So thanks for everybody for um, zooming in to Rancho Cordova, California, 95670 and 95742. Uh, we are very happy that you did and um, join us. Um, for our next uh, Zoom, which will be March 19th on the Rancho Cordova Civic Center. Thank you, David. We are so fortunate to have you as a resource. I don't know about anybody else, but it sort of feels comforting when you hear this information from someone you know. So with that, I think I'm going to say good night. Um, stay well, wear masks, and uh, looking forward to when we can get together in person again. Good night, everybody. Thank you all.